happy scripture, something we're not finding a whole lot of in, in the book of Jeremiah as we've been going through this, but um, here it is, a happy scripture today. And so it seems odd because here we've had this, this trauma yet again in our country and sorrow and hardship in our country this last week and how to deal with that you know, it's like, well, if we, if we change what we're going to talk about every time uh, there's a mass shooting, well, I'd get nothing else done in this country. But um, I think this word can be a good a reminder to us in this time that, yes, God, God's judgment does fall. God gives warning of, of impending judgment, and his judgment falls, but yet he always has brings a happy ending there's always good news with God when he's bringing his his judgment upon people or when there's punishment it's always for the purpose of redemption and so I think as we look at this word this morning I think we can see and hold that same hope in ourselves because yes I think that God is bringing a word of warning to us in, at times calling us to repentance just as much as he was calling the, the people of Judah here. But let us hear also, in addition to God's word, of calling us back, that when we return to the Lord, that there is joy, that there will be a happy day. And so we're going to read this morning in Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're not on the screen, okay. I mean, it's 31, chapter 31, beginning, we're, verse 3, and then verses 7 through 16, 31 through 34. Did I forget to load that? Okay. Anyway, verse 3. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. And then at verse 7. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in the distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young of the flocks and herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then young women will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. And then at verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. 
I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach, teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, again this morning we remember that, you know, I want to look about at God. I want to talk about God this morning and not just about all the, the terrible things that are happening because our God is a good God. Our God is a God who, who loves us. He has, has loved his people with an everlasting love. From the very beginning, God loved his people and he was at work in the lives of his people. But God, he always wants what's best for folks. Yes, our God gets angry. He does, there is such a thing as the wrath of God. That's not something we like to talk about much in, in our church and in a lot of churches these days, but it is a very real thing. And we should be glad about that, that, that God does get angry. He gets angry at the things that people do to one another when, when people are hurtful to, to each other. Uh, when we commit sins, you know, it makes God angry. And we should be glad about that because God doesn't, isn't going to put up with this kind of stuff. You know, we put up with it for far too long. People in, a, in we know ourselves, you know, we tend to, we can hold on to grudges. We, we get mad and then, you know, somebody hurts us and, and we'll hang on to it forever, it seems like. We've probably known people like that, that Somebody hurt them 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they're still carrying that burden. They're still carrying that grudge. You know, Jesus had said that if we don't forgive others, then, then we cannot be forgiven. And that's because, I think, because we're not reflecting the heart of God. We're not reflecting the image of God when we don't forgive others. Our God is a forgiving God. He does not hold on to grudges. Last week, we talked about, we read how God had said the... Um, punishment was going to last for 70 years, that they would be in exile for 70 years, starting from the, that time the very first ones went into exile, probably in 605 B.C. But God doesn't hold on to that. He's, yes, his anger comes, but then it's done. When he brings his judgment, which is mostly just the, the consequences, the, the natural consequences of our actions, of our false actions, um, then it's over with. And God, he wants good things for his people. Our God is very slow to anger. It takes him a long time. He doesn't just, he's not one. I mean, we, we know that, that every, we step out of line and we get zapped by lightning. You know, it doesn't happen that way. God gives us every opportunity to repent. But the people of Judah, they just didn't repent. I mean, they had, they had every chance to see. They should have known that, yes, God even punishes those that he loves dearly, the ones that are his chosen people, his special ones. They had seen what had happened to the nation of Israel not even 140 years before, that God allowed the nation of Israel to be destroyed and taken into captivity he was telling Judah, this is going to happen to you if you don't listen to me, if you don't come back. They did not repent, and so eventually the, the judgment falls. And I think this is the work, something that we need to be aware of in our country as well, that if God is calling us back to repentance, and, uh, but we, we just, I don't see a lot of that happening. I don't see us repenting for our sins too much and turning away from the violence that's so prevalent in our system. I don't see us turning away much from, from racism and these, all the sins that we have in our country. If we don't listen to the Lord, if we don't come back, then judgment will fall. But after that, you know, it's a good place to be, to be in the hands of Almighty God. That is the most safe and secure place to be is because we know that, yes, if God brings his, his punishment, God allows, his or allows us to experience the consequences of our actions, which I think we're getting. Um, 
It's always about redemption. He wants to bring us back. He wants us to be in relationship. And so there's always the good news on the other side. As our, our call to worship this morning, that scripture verse, it said, you know, yes, sorrow may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. God wants good things for his people. You know, I'm not one to preach um, a prosperity gospel. And yet, it's, there's, there's some truth to that, that God really does want to pour out good gifts and good things for his people. It, you know, it says right in here as we read, you know, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, the young of the flocks and the herds. It will be like a well-watered garden and they will sorrow no more. You know, Jesus said he wants us to have that life and have it in abundance. So God wants good things for us. When we return to the Lord, when we come back and get through the time of challenge, he's calling us back to good things. God has good, as we read even last, year, last Sunday in chapter 29, that God has good plans for us, for a hope and a future for his people. He wants to give good things to his people. Now we know that... Um, prophecies can have more than one fulfillment this prophecy here speaking of of Rachel weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they are no more the immediate fulfillment there is because of the the exile the the um, destruction of Jerusalem while the the people went through it two years of of being s under siege and so the famine became so severe that they even had to resort to cannibalism, and many, many people died from that. But we know this, this verse of Scripture was also used by, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew to refer to the slaughter of the innocents. Remember when, when Herod ordered the, the little boys, the ba boy babies there in Bethlehem to be put to death because of the birth of Jesus. And I have no doubt that Rachel was weeping again at the Holocaust, when many people again were killed, her children were gone uh, because they were no more. The ingathering of the, of the people, calling them back. God calls his children back from all the corners of the earth. Again, immediately speaking of the time, 70 years after they were taken into exile, that they were brought back into the place the land of promise that God had given to them. We see that in our own day still happening now. You know, it's been, again, at least in the last 150 years, the Jewish people have been brought from all the corners of the earth, returning to Palestine in great numbers. So prophecies can have more than one fulfillment. There's, there is a prophecy here. We didn't read this this morning, but at the very end, the last sentence in chapter 31 that I wonder if this one is, is something that's yet to be fulfilled. I mean, Jeremiah talking about them coming back to Jerusalem, and it says the city will never again be uprooted or demolished. It's like, well, that one w did not come true, because maybe it will in the future, because uh, we know that the city was destroyed again in 70 AD, and the people scattered once again. But Jesus had said, that that was because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. And so um, the punishment fell again. So it seems, like, it seems like often the people come back to the land, they're brought back to the land, but they didn't really come back to the Lord. And that's the challenge. It seems then in many ways the, the Jewish folks here have missed out on the new covenant that God has promised for them. And this is the joy we find in, our, in the scripture this morning, this passage that's uh, uh, quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, where they talk about the new covenant that is mediated to us by Jesus Christ, where God says, he says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I mean, they broke the first covenant, right? They were not able to keep it. So now the new covenant is going to be no longer an external thing where it's about laws and rules and, and things that you have to do, but now he's going to put it in our hearts. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. The law didn't go away. You know, that hasn't changed. 
God still expects his people to walk in holiness. We're still supposed to follow the teachings of God and the commandments of the Lord. But now, rather than being written on stone tablets, they're written on our hearts. We know, because this is the Holy Spirit now that speaks to us. He says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us. He's been given to us because Christ has come, because Christ has opened the way for us. We receive the Holy Spirit. He's the one who tells us right from wrong. He teaches us right from wrong. He tells us when we're out of line. So we know in our hearts when we're doing wrong. He says, no longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, will remember their sins no more. Christ has come to show us what the Father is like, to help us to know God. And the Holy Spirit shows us what Christ is. He's always pointing the spotlight on Jesus so that we can know the Father. We can come to Christ and know God and understand Him. But this is another prophecy of Scripture that I think it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ in His coming, but is there yet another fulfillment? Because um, is this true that we would say that um, no... No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Does everybody in the world really know the Lord? Does everybody know God? I think we all, I think all human beings have the capacity to know God. God created us that way. He put something within us so that every person can know God. Everybody can, has the opportunity through what we can see in nature and how God acts. Everybody can know God. But I think we all, we tend to, as people, we tend to try to create God in our own image, you know, where we, we decide what we like and, you know, what we want our God to be like and, and um, pick and choose different characteristics or, or what have you. As Jesus told us to go and make disciples, to teach people. And so I think we do need to still teach people about God. There was a there was a blog uh, thing I received yes the other day, a research recently done um, from Lifeway Research. They're a, a branch of the Southern Baptist Convention, I believe. Um, it doesn't say how how the research was was conducted, but they did a, a survey, and it said n- nearly half. This is what they found: nearly half of non-church attendees never think about the afterlife. They said almost 75 would not attend a seeker small group. So we try to use our small groups to attract people. 75% said they ain't going. More than 60 would not attend a worship service. They said, but 61% would attend a church-sponsored event on neighborhood safety. So they're not going to come to church but they'll, they'll enter our building if we're going to do a neighborhood watch program or, or something like that. And so, you know, Jesus has told us we need to be making disciples. We need to help people to know the Lord and to come to know them. And, and I think here's something that we as a church can repent of, that we have not done a real good job of evangelism and, and sharing the gospel outside of our walls. And part of that, I think, you know, we belong to... The, uh, the mainline denominations and such. And I think for a long time, we just flat didn't have to think about that. You know, we thought, well, we're living in a, in a society where it mostly Christian in our nation. And, and so coming to church was the norm. Well, that's changed. That's not the way it is anymore. And so we've got to adapt. We've, we've got to change our thinking and get realize that, you know, the world still needs Jesus. People might not, they don't realize that. A lot of folks don't think they, they, they're doing just fine, thank you very much. But we know that Christ is the only answer for, for human sin. 
And so how do we carry that out? You know, this is going to become, we, we are repenting of that as a church, and we're saying, Lord, help us. Come Holy Spirit and fill us again. Grant us the gift of evangelism in here. Give us heart for the people outside these walls. Lord, not just so that we can get them in here so that they can help support our budget. No, give us heart of compassion so that we can love these folks and share with them this fabulous thing that we have in Jesus Christ. And so this is what we want us to do. You know, we're going to be taking some steps this year um, in evangelism and discipleship, making that a real priority in our church. One of the first things we want to do, of course, is, is um, make sure that we ourselves are walking with Christ and understanding who God is. And so we're going to enter into a time this fall where, uh, where we're going to read through the whole of the New Testament together as a body. And so um, we have a new book. Yes, it is a New Testament. It just is laid out differently. It doesn't have chapters and verses, and it's laid out a little bit more in a chronological order in some, in some sense and broken down in uh, segments of about 10 pages each. So... This is what we're going to do in the fall. We're going to start reading together, reading together and read through over a period of eight weeks so that we have God's word in our hearts so that we will be feasting on God's word, that we will know God better and have him in our hearts and understand because we cannot share with the world around us if we're not, if we're not fully grounded ourselves. And so this is a chance for us to grow in our own faith, go deeper in Christ, and then try to share with others around us. Yes, we're going to have to do things differently with, to meet people where they are. They are, not, they are flat not going to come. Many of them are, are not just going to come walking through our doors. We've got to go out to where they are. But we can also recognize that there are a lot of folks that do come in our door, mainly in the 4th Street side, and um, our fellowship hall sees a lot of people in the course of a week. And so we're starting to think, ha, huh, how can we make connections with these folks and begin to, to reach them a little bit? You know, we're starting real simple and, and small. We've created a little brochure that we can put downstairs and, and hope that folks might pick that up. Um, some of you who have artistic skills or, you know, be thinking about how can we look at the fellowship hall as a palette of you know how we can share a message this is our this is our screen if you will a, a place where we can share a message to the people that are coming in each week how can we share the gospel in a subtle way or in a small way that that might make sense to that so we you know in prayer about that thinking about that you know are there posters are there is there artwork that we could think about um, scripture verses and such Primarily, the man who wrote this blog, he says, you know, we need to be living it. They're not, people don't so much want to hear what we have to say until they want to see how we live our lives. If this gospel is not making any difference in us, then, you know, what have we got to, to sell and to share? So the primary thing, we need to be living out what we believe before other people and show them yes we can get we can walk alongside we can get involved in in the various charitable activities that go on in the community work alongside people if that's where they are if that's where we can make that connection and begin to build relationships um, they want to see the love of God active in our lives let it begin with us again can we show the love of God loving each other through our differences. You know, the Bible, Jesus said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. In our nation, we've never been more divided than we are right now. And if we don't get it together, if we don't learn to love each other, we will not stand. So prayer is the most important thing we can do. Pray for the Lord. Pray that God would give us a heart for evangelism, a heart of love for one another 
and for people outside of these walls. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, I thank you for your mercy that is never-ending. I thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. I thank you, Lord, that you love us too much to leave us in our present state. We are sinners, Lord, and we confess that before you right now. We have sinned in our church. We have sinned in our nation. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Help us to truly repent and to be that light that you've called us to be, to help our nation to repent of our sins, to turn back. And I thank you, Lord, that you always bring us hope of a brighter tomorrow, the hope that we have in Christ, that Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. But Lord, help us not to take that for granted. And Lord, help us to share that with those around us out in our community. Lord, we know that every person still needs Jesus, that the, the gospel message is still just as relevant. It doesn't matter what generation anybody is from. People still need to know that there is a God who loves them and that there is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. Fill our hearts again, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give us boldness. Give us courage to speak. But even more important than words, to live lives of honesty and truth before you. May our lives reflect what we believe as they, they truly do. May our lives reflect the love of God in every aspect. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I know we want